gravitated towards um, different challenges. I never stayed in a single industry for for more than um, a little while. Um, and after a few years of being a software engineer, um, I really found that my true passion was uh, leading teams and growing teams and building businesses. Um, I, I spent a bunch of time um, at Bridgewater, the hedge fund. Um, if anyone's familiar with the book Principles by Ray Dalio, um, you know, I was actually on the senior management team when we uh, were debating the very first version of that um, and then handed it out at a town hall as stapled printouts. Um, and so, you know, I was there for about seven and a half years and I held various senior management roles. And as that was um, kind of coming to the end of my tenure there, it was a great ride, but I was looking to do something different. And I ended up in the New York City startup world. Um, and I, I think I found like, you know, a, a really great community there and something that was really true to my heart. Um, and so I worked for a few different um, organizations in a full-time CTO capacity. And then a few years ago in 2018, I started a few ventures of my own with a couple of business partners. Um, and the principal um, um, one that is relevant to this conversation um, is, is one called Actualize, where we have been working for the past three years with a portfolio of startups in New York City at different stages of their development. Um, and whether it's, you know, an idea stage where we have to build out an MVP or whether it's someone who's gained traction and product market fit, but they have to scale. Um, it's been it's been a real wonderful experience working with a variety of great founders and great products. Um, and so, you know, in, in this conversation, I, you know, it's a, it's a really good fit in terms of talking about from both, um, you know, a larger company, but also a startup perspective, uh, what is really required um, from a people perspective, from a team's perspective, in, in order, at least in my experience anyway, um, obviously, you know, there's lots of different experiences out there and lots of people with different approaches and values and so on. But, you know, this is kind of just a glimpse into um, what I've learned um, through uh, many successes and many failures um, in terms of what, you know, makes for a really wonderful, high-performing team that that not only does great things but also loves you know being together and and being in the battle great great so yeah i think um, that's a great introduction i think you covered well in terms of the different experiences that you had um so uh, in today's session when you share about your uh, uh, team building experiences would it be more related to um, like the teams that you are currently working around and building it up, or would it be a more holistic uh, overview of the different lessons that you may have learned? Uh, I'd say from the different experiences. Yeah, you know, I think I think the better way to approach it probably is just talking about like the holistic um, learnings. Um, you know, I can certainly go into examples, even if I might not be able to name names. I could certainly go into examples. Um, you know, and so and so, where should we start? I guess, um, you know, for me, um, I would say where you start is thinking about what kind of organization you want to have, what the culture is, um, and you know, I've experienced many, and if if some of you here have have you know kept up with what's going on at Bridgewater, have have read principles. You know, you'll see that that's one version of it. Um, and I have a lot of experience with that. But at the same time, that culture is not for everybody. In fact, it's it's not for many. Right. It takes a very um, it only really works for a small percentage of the population. Um, and so I think the first thing is really trying to figure out what it, what are you trying to be? You know, and, if, and since we're talking about startups here, which is my passion, um, you know, startups to me are not only entrepreneurial. But you really have to build a team that is, you know, I mean, there's the obvious things, right? People have to get along. There has to be cohesion. There has to be a common mission and a common goal and all of those sorts of things that everybody kind of knows. But 
what makes a difference between having a average team that is you know kind of going along doing their thing and producing decent outcomes from an exceptional team that is what makes or breaks the true unicorns right the the organizations that really break out and not only gain traction but but win their win their segment or or win their market right and 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 for me personally that culture is one where you have a mix of different elements on one side you have to be very willing and open to working with each other in a transparent way which includes giving and receiving difficult feedback um, you know you have to be on the same page in terms of wanting to be the best you can be and wanting to do the best that's possible for the organization and for the product now a lot of people can say that but it's actually quite difficult to do in reality because we all have this annoying thing called an ego, right? And, and, and it really prevents us sometimes from going into those situations with an open mind. And, okay. and so one of the things that is crucial for, for organizations that I've been part of is when you assess people, when you interview people, when you're looking for who is a good fit for the team, you have to go into the depth of conversation to understand either how have they handled those kinds of situations before or how would they going forward if they're in an environment that allows it. You know, sometimes people come from, let's say, a big company and maybe naturally they want that, but the big company has not allowed them to really um, behave that way or operate that way because usually big companies or academic institutions have cultures that are quite opposite that. Um, right. and, and so, you know, looking for people who are able to be transparent, even in the face of having made mistakes and failures, being able to look at those things as learning opportunities instead of reasons to cover things up or to try to make yourself look good. You know, when I tell people when I first meet someone new that I'm interviewing or when I first uh, meet a new person that's joined a team is, look, guys, like I make a thousand mistakes a day. It's all fine. It's good. Like making mistakes is human. It's normal. And in fact, if you're not making big enough mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. You don't have a big enough goal because to not make mistakes means you're doing things that have been done before, that you've done before a million times and know exactly how to do. And when you're in the startup world, most of the time you have a vague picture of what you're trying to achieve, but the rest is a very iterative um, you know, experimental type of environment and you have to take risks. If you don't take risks, you're not going to get a big payoff. So there's all of those pieces, but then there's also the values piece that goes along with that, right? So people can operate a certain way, but at the core of them, what are they like? Um, does someone value money? Does someone value fame? Does someone value, um, you know, looking good? Does someone value pleasing people? There's all kinds of people and there's no right or wrong thing. It's like eye color, right? Like everyone has an eye color. You can't change it. You can't really change some of your core values. They're sort of a, a mix of what you were born with and what environment you were raised in. But there are other aspects of it that you can evolve and that you can evolve quickly, actually, if you intellectually want it. So, you know, it's sort of looking for these characteristics that align with the values. And then the last piece of it is like a true passion for the mission. Um, you know, it's not just it's not just are you having a good time every day? That's a big part of it. Like for me and, and my team and the different teams that we interact with. Honestly, we don't we try not to engage with anybody if we don't have alignment on values and mission, because honestly, we wouldn't enjoy our days. Um, now, I realize not everyone has that luxury, so I don't take it for granted. But at the same time, you know, everyone that's attending today probably is very well qualified to work in many different situations in many different organizations. And so you know, choosing one and choosing people to go along for the ride with you um, with a mission that is truly meaningful to you. Um, and it could be for lots of different reasons, but, you know, a startup, especially you're working long hours, you're with the team. Uh, you know, it's true of many jobs, but in startups, especially you're with a team, definitely more than like your outside friends and your family. 
Um, you're, you're working on really hard problems. You have to have a lot of trust. You have to uh, sometimes have faith that the thing you're after is important and is something that's going to work even when you're facing big failures. And, and so like, if you don't have that, um, and I don't know in India, this may or may not be an expression, but like in America, an expression is uh, brothers in arms. And it sort of means like, you know, it's, it's sort of from the military where you have to be, you know, you're in the foxhole together, you're taking the next hill together. And that is something that requires just the combination of all these different aspects. You have to care about the thing you're after. You have to care about the people that are in that hole with you and that are driving up that next hill with you. And you just have to have that like drive. And that drive comes from, I believe, very strongly a mix of those values and a true internal passion for the mission. So I, I don't know if that went in some different directions, but like that's just a brain dump of like how I think about it and how, you know, and, and I see on this on this call, one person that's here is uh, Nuno. He's actually someone who um, is on the team with me. Um, and, and you know, he has a lot of experience in, in similar areas. And, you know, it's, I think it's I think it's true for all different industries. I think you know the the content doesn't matter in my mind. Um, it's it's these other elements, and so when you think about that, how it applies to you, or maybe it doesn't apply to certain people. Like it's okay. What is that framework? What are the principles? What are the values that are appropriate for your situation, for your right. products and your mission situation, and then find people, interview people, assess people, whether it's at the beginning of their time with you or every few months, like people change over time and the mission could change over time, assess people against that framework. And, you know, I don't want to say such a bold statement, but I can almost guarantee you're going to have far better outcomes than what most people do in terms of how they think about and assess people. Because, most people assess and think about people in a very superficial way, right? When you interview people, most of the time, especially at larger organizations, you're basically figuring out if you want to go have a beer with the guy. Like that's kind of what you're looking at, right? You don't ask enough deep questions to understand more than do you get along? Like do your personalities match? Does the person have a minimum level of capabilities that are required for the job? But for me, those are just the beginning pieces. And in a startup where things change every day, priorities change, teams change, you can have a massive success on Monday and by Wednesday, you're facing your biggest failure. That takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of, um, and this might be another term that doesn't translate well, but like I like to call it intestinal fortitude. Sort of like you have the stomach for it. Um, and, and if you do, then wonderful. You need to surround yourself by like-minded people. That doesn't mean block out other perspectives, right? Like-minded in my mind, again, is these values and the passion for the mission and the capabilities and all of those things being in a package. Um, the, the specifics can, can vary um, at any time. So like that, that's my very, very long answer to um, the first part. Um, and then we could certainly go into like, how do you assess these things or yeah. specific example yeah. um, and so on, but, you know, take it wherever I, it makes sense, please. Yeah. I think, uh, that would be prudent to really deep dive into this because I think, um, your answer kind of, uh, covers like the envelope around, uh, I think, uh, the right teams basically by forming the, I think the alignment with people and, uh, basically be able to recognize, uh, let's say that, uh, now, uh, you know, be able to take that decision by recognizing that whether someone uh, aligns with uh, your core values and the mission and uh, whatever, whatever you stand for, for example. So what I would like to probably I think uh, would be interesting to know is uh, like, say, how do you do that really like uh, practically, like uh, are there certain questions or maybe is there one this question or like as yeah. exercise that you would usually do when yeah. you are hiring yeah. and uh, how does how has that worked for you 
Okay, perfect. Yes, yes. So let's let's dive into it. So yeah, everything I said, you know, it's very high level, right? It's very conceptual mm -hmm. and theoretical. So let's make it practical, right? Um, so why don't I first just describe like a process, um, and and if an ex if an, if a specific example would be helpful, great. But I think the process is is the more important piece. Um, and, and I have many examples of this over the years, um, as it's, you know, been refined and, and so on. And, and the truth of the story is that, you know, I'll tie it back to my experience. So when I joined Bridgewater, which I think is the most probably known example in the business world of, um, of a radical culture and, and, and these different aspects that I'm describing being put into action with basically no constraints, like, right, unlimited funding, um, unlimited access to talent, um, really interesting problems, um, you know, global recognition. You have all the ingredients where you can do whatever you want, basically. Um, but before that, you know, I really was isolated um, in a sense. I worked for different companies. I worked for I worked for Motorola back in the day before the telecom bust when it was huge. And I swore I'd never work for a big company again. Um, I, I worked for a small engineering company in Chicago um, before I worked for Bridgewater. And, you know, those other experiences were, were interesting um, and they were useful and they were great at the time. But I really didn't learn anything about people. Um, I learned about code. I learned about projects. I learned about, um, you know, people giving you direction and you listening <laughs> like um, that was sort of what I learned. And, and when I got to Bridgewater, that was a place where when I joined, it was 300 people. When I left seven and a half years later, it was 1800 people. Um, and we, you know, we were managing $160 billion uh, for the largest institutional investors in the world. And, you know, with, with global recognition at that point and, and we invest we invested more money and man hours in understanding people and understanding how to assess people than we did in most other things. The only thing we spent more resources on was our investment strategies. Nothing else. The number one was investment strategies. Number two was understanding and assessing people. We spent tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars and thousands and thousands of hours over the years. We hired some of the best world's experts and, and so on to supplement our own knowledge. And we brought in senior leaders from all sorts of organizations, even including the Navy SEALs. And, and, and like to learn, what did other people do? What did the world's best psychologists know about this? Um, what did they not know? Because there wasn't a lot of information out there that made sense to us. It was all like the kind of like newest fad, right? emotional intelligence this year or, uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, uh, leading by influence the other year and these other, you know, these different business fads, but the core of all of them is people. None of those systems, no culture, no success or failure comes without the people. And the people are the most important thing because they're the ones that actually create everything. They're the ones that interact with everything. Um, and they're the ones who can change the, the future of, of the organization, whatever that organization is, whether it's a business, a school, a religious organization, a country, it doesn't matter. And so, you know, that forms the basis for a lot of, of my, my initial learnings on all of these things was being a member of the senior management team through all of that. And then when I got I I'll also get back to the direct question in a second. I just want to put it in context. When I left Bridgewater and I got into the startup world, it was so fascinating because I took all of this information and all of this learning and all of the successes and failures that I had in the seven and a half years there in that very specific environment. And then when I got out, I learned very quickly what didn't work in the real world, right? The real world being a place that didn't have the same luxuries we had at Bridgewater where you didn't have the ability to completely insulate yourself. You didn't have the ability to tap any person in the world and they'd basically come work with you, um, you know, and so on. And, and so what I learned very quickly was we were, and I knew it through my time at Bridgewater, but I didn't know what to do with it. And when I got out, I really started to learn 
how to combine the power of everything that we created at Bridgewater from a cultural and from a people perspective, but then also marrying it up with um, what's become very important to me is this, uh, this type of empathy, a type of empathy for people in, and, and in our case, right, I'm an engineer, right? Like I'm an engineering manager. Um, and, and so like this engineering empathy or engineering for empathy, depending on what the case may be. And that was a big part of what was missing. Um, and, and so now the way we operate and the way that we try to um, instill in all the companies we work with, advise, whatever the case may be, is this combination of, if you think about it like, Almost, if you think about it like software, it's almost like you have the technical aspect, right? You have sort of the functional requirements, um, and those are sort of like the principles and the values and the structure and the framework and how do you assess people and all of those things. And, and then you sort of have the non-functional requirements. Maybe this is a bad analogy. I'm realizing it's not quite a great analogy, but go with non-functional requirements, and those are the things that you can't even necessarily put them on paper all the time. Um, but those are the things like empathy and not just empathy, but um, I learned this word a few years ago while I was trying to figure out what the heck it was. It's this word mentalization and it's the ability, it's this specific flavor almost of empathy where you can truly put yourself in another person's situation and you try to see the world from their point of view. And, and to truly do that goes beyond basic empathy. Um, you know, the best salespeople in the world, for example, have this ability really uh, strongly. Um, the best leaders have it really strongly because you're able to quickly see the world from someone else's point of view and understand what, understand what motivates them, understand what, um, what they see, understand how they need to process information so that you can be on the same page, um, like really, really, not just thinking you are, but really, really communicating. Um, and so, so anyway, long story short, to get into concrete things, we have and always will have and always advise people to have a very systematic assessment process for interviewing people. Usually interviews are, you do some kind of like, hacker rank test or something to check your basic skills. Then you have like a phone interview. I guess now it doesn't matter with the pandemic. They're all, they're all phone interviews, but like you have a first interview where you kind of do a basic technical and personality assessment, and then you sort of meet more people and the other people are sort of just asking you random shit, right? They're sort of saying, draw this like project you worked on or, um, whatever. And those are all fine and valid interview questions for certain things. But once you assess someone's capabilities, you don't need to keep asking for different flavors of that. What we really try to do in that systematic process is focus on those other pieces that are usually missed. Um, so for example, how do you understand someone's values and whether they align or not? That's a very, that's a very hard thing if you just think about it at first, because like what, you, if you ask someone in the interview process, like what are your values? you know, you'll get a whole range of answers. You'll get great answers and you'll get stupid answers and you'll get answers like, you know, those, what, what the horrible like interview coaches tell you to do. My, my value is working really hard. Uh, my biggest weakness is I, I, uh, I try too hard. It was bullshit, right? Um, and how do you get at those things without it being fake? Um, so what we have found what I found um, over the years is you have different interviews that are structured to address different parts of what a person is like. So if you lay out a framework for what a person is like, you have values. That's what are your core beliefs? What are your true North stars that everything you do, your daily decisions are pointed against? Um, and that could be anything. It does, there's no right or wrong answer, but it is, it is what it is. And it changes in people slowly over time, right? Their life events and circumstances that change them, having kids, getting married, getting a new job maybe, going through a tragedy. There are things that shape that, but it's usually something that changes very slowly over time for somebody. And it does evolve over time, but slowly. Then there's um, 
And there's capabilities, right? Capabilities are things that are not quite skills, but they're things that are your natural abilities. So things like conceptual thinking, logical reasoning, uh, empathy. Um, um, you know, there's so many different things you have in that bucket. And then lastly, there's skills. Skills are the hard skills, right? There, do you know how to code in Java? They're, uh, you know, how proficient are you with SQL queries? They're the literal things that you need to know. But those are things that if you have the right capabilities, you can learn. So most interview processes have it the other way around. You spend the most time on skills. You spend a little bit of time on capabilities. And you usually spend almost no time or no time at all on values. And so for me, flipping that upside down is the most effective way to get at the people that you are looking to get into your organization to drive what you need to be driven. So focusing the most on values, then the next on capabilities, skills, as long as someone has a baseline of skills, I don't spend another minute on it. Because if they have a baseline of skills, then they can learn anything else as long as the values and the capabilities are there. So assessing values is really just a conversation, but you have to know how to have the conversation. And so the conversation is usually about a topic that has nothing to do with work. Um, it's not a random conversation, to be clear. It's, it's a very structured conversation in the interviewer's mind. Um, and what you're trying to get at is you're trying to understand the deep why behind decisions that someone made in their life. So for example, Person X goes to Harvard University. They get a degree in computer science. They're valedictorian. They go on and they work for a large uh, bank. I don't know. Let's say they go into work for Morgan Stanley. They get promoted quickly. They have, they're great on paper, wonderful on paper. You have another candidate, Y, who might have gone to a local school they might have only gotten a B average. Um, they might have been in some smaller organizations and um, on paper, not as impressive, right? But what kind of conversation do you want to have with those people to understand their values? Because what I've found, and I've interviewed thousands of people um, in this way over the years, and a lot of times the people that went to Harvard, you know why they went to Harvard? They went to Harvard because their dad went there. They didn't go because they had a, a real thought process that said, what's the best thing for my life? Um, the reason they went to Morgan Stanley is because their dad's best friend worked there and got him an internship. He didn't have to work for it. He just went. And the reason he got promoted quickly was because he's a smooth talker. Imagine that person. Now what does that person look like to you? That person who's got a perfect resume isn't looking so great anymore for my high-performing team. And if you ask them about those things, why did you – Harvard's wonderful. Why did you go there? You know, maybe there will be a bullshit answer at first, but if you keep asking why and you keep digging into that, you'll get at the truth. Or you'll find that you can't get at a reasonable answer, which gives you the same answer. And so – you know, someone who might have gone to that state school who might have not, uh, who might not have the same impressive resume, they might have grown up very poor. They might be the first person in their family to go to college. They might have had to work full time while being a full time student to afford it. That's why they had to be average. They might be at smaller companies because they didn't have access to those opportunities. But when you ask them the same questions, they will often give you these amazing stories. These amazing stories of like, I had to work since I was 14 years old because my family couldn't afford books. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. That was the best one I could get into. And I worked my ass off, but I was on four hours of sleep every night for four years because I had to work, because otherwise I would never be able to pay for it. Um, and and that the, the difference in values between those two people is tremendous. I would, every single moment of every single day, choose the second person over the first one. 
every single time. And that is, I think, a huge problem in how the world generally interviews and assesses people. That's just one example. And, and so the, you know, the process for that is, is literally just a dynamic conversation about something that doesn't have to do with work because you don't want to cloud the answers with knowledge. You know, someone who is very technically proficient can give you excellent technical answers to things, but that doesn't actually tell you anything about how they think. That just tells you that, well, they might think really well or they might just have a really good memory. You don't know. But when you understand people's true motivations, you start to get at their values. When you start to realize that they can think about things at a conceptual level and their goal in life, let's say, might be they want to have a happy life with a family where their kids all have opportunities they didn't have. And at the same time, they want to work on products that have impact to the world. That's a level of thinking, for example, even in that statement that many people don't have. Many people would just say, I needed a job. I applied to lots of jobs. I got this job. I get the paycheck. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. Each person is different. Again, color of the eyes, it's fine. But when you're trying to do something really uh, difficult, and when you're trying to do something where you really need someone who has that passion and that drive, um, and all of those different elements coming together, it's not always the people that look great on paper. It, oftentimes it's not the people that look great on paper because the stories behind it and the thought process behind it and what their potential is, is not usually refre reflected adequately on paper or with superficial interviews. No, that's true, definitely. I think um, one of the um, key things uh, um, you know, for anyone recruiting, I think is to be able to uh, differentiate uh, between the real thing and the chasma, I think. Just like you said, like someone could come as pretty good on the surface, but then you have to um, keep digging in and keep knowing better and better so as to be able to make the right decision. Um, yeah. If I ask and, something, and, 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 sorry, one, one, more, one more second. It, it, the other aspects so just for a minute like the same approach applies to technical problems right if you're doing a whiteboarding exercise i don't care what language you used i don't care if you can remember the syntax for something on a whiteboard that makes that doesn't affect your job uh, capabilities at all but what does matter is the same approach right like don't show me those details walk me through your thought process how did you break down the problem how did you architect the solution? And it doesn't mean you have to be an architect. It could be an individual contributor, but they still architect the solution. What was their thought process? What were the whys behind their decisions? That gives you so much more insight into what somebody's like than just knowing they can remember complex syntax, you know, without looking it up. Because I think, in fact, uh, the syntax is available. I think uh, now the skill that is required is uh, for someone to know which syntax to use rather than where to find it or which syntax it is like. They, that is something people can find. And I usually use this word personally for would be like coachability, like how much they're coachable, which could reflect from when they're giving them, let's say, the help, for example, if they're able to take that and further grow their answer. Because uh, in the live world, I think that's exactly how it would work. Like uh, when, let's say, um, as a startup uh, employee, you're working with someone, I think that's the kind of collaboration you would be having. Yeah. Like uh, you and the uh, next person are going to work on ideas. You're going to give some input and they're going to grow their input. And then they're going to come back and, you know, like give yes. you the input so that you can Very give back much. the input and so on. Very much. That's an excellent point. Um, I agree with that completely. I think coachability, you know, for me to put it in the framework that I've been talking about, for me, coachability is a combination of all of those aspects, values, capabilities, and skills. Mm -hmm. um, and so someone who is coachable, by definition, values learning, right? They right. value continuous improvement. They value self-improvement. They value um, they value those things more than looking good. 
that's important. Capabilities wise, you have to be able to listen, truly listen, right? Even if you don't like what you're hearing, you have to listen. And you have to say, is that true? Could that be true? Let me think about that more. Instead of most people's egotistical response is, oh, that, that's not true. That's not me. That, I, no, 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 no. And, and, and then skills, like you can learn to be a better um, player, right? Player coach dynamic. You can learn to be a better player because over time you develop the skills for things like listening, for things like identifying important things versus unimportant things um, and so on. So coachability to me is, is very important because it embodies a lot of the important aspects of the different dimensions. So, right, if, um, and you want it to go both ways in a sense, um, certainly let's say an individual contributor, right? An individual contributor who's coachable, even if they're starting at a lower level of, of, of skill, let's say, than somebody who has a higher level of skill but is not coachable, right? Mm -hmm. They're gonna quickly pass that other person if they're in the right in culture, right? If they're in that right environment, because someone who's really coachable, but who doesn't have a good coach, not going to work that well. But if you have somebody who is not coachable, but is very talented in something, maybe they're here and you have someone that starts off lower, but they're very coachable and you have a good coach. Again, like they're going to, they're going to progress slowly, but they're going to quickly overtake them. And so coachability, I think is, is very important and it's part of adaptability. Um, are you able to um, adjust to changing circumstances? Um, that's actually a big thing in startups too, which is just an interesting side point. You know, there's a lot of unknown stuff in startups. There's a lot of ambiguity. And another thing that people differ in, just like eye color again, is their ability to deal with ambiguity. On one end of it, some people freeze up. They need to be told specific things. And if, if something changes, they get anxious and stressed because they don't know how to handle it. Not like don't know is the wrong way to say it. It's like they're not built mm -hmm. to handle that particularly well. Mm -hmm. There are other people who are built to handle it very well. Like anything can change. It's fine. That's just part of life. Like stuff changes. I have to adapt, right? And as humans, we're actually quite good at adapting, but sometimes we get in our own way. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think coachability and adaptability are very important attributes. And, you know, to get at those things in an assessment process, I think that's all about like you have to ask experiential questions. Um, you have to kind of get deep wise and deep understanding about things like, you know, was there a circumstance you were in where, um, you know, you made a major mistake? And right. Who helped you through it? What did you learn from it? You know, mm -hmm. people that don't have that quality at all are going to say, are going to give you those stupid answers. They're going to say, and I got this, so many times you get this kind of thing, right? My biggest mistake was I, I proposed a solution that ended up being wrong. Ooh, that's a good one. Let's talk about that. And you talk about it and you talk about it. And you, talk, you spend a lot of time talking about it. And at the end of the story, you understand that the project was a wild success. Mm -hmm. And that they realized themselves that their solution was bad. And they came up with a better one. It's like, that was just a waste of my life. Like, I don't know anything about you other than you tried to prove to me that how good you are. Like, that's not someone who's coachable. Right, right. Someone who's coachable will approach the world as, huh, what don't I know? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, I just messed that up. I need to learn from that. Yeah. Who can help me? Who can teach me? That's right. someone who's coachable. Mm -hmm. The best athlete in the world, the best mm -hmm. athletes in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any if everyone knows this, but the best athletes in the world spend usually hours a day mm -hmm. watching videos of their own screw ups mm -hmm. so that they learn how to improve. Right. That is something that is true across disciplines, athletes, business people musicians, could be anything. People mm -hmm. that truly care about being the best, not just say it because their ego wants it, but truly, truly care mm -hmm. and are truly coachable are the ones that watch over and over their screw-ups. Right. Because we want to learn from them. 
and they don't care who knows, they'll do it publicly. They'll, they'll, they'll have all their friends there. Help me figure out what else I screwed up. And it's fun mm -hmm. for them, energizing. Yeah. Right, right. No, true that. And it's, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, you are hitting the right points, in fact. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's going very interesting. But, uh, uh, you know, for the constant of time, we may yeah, have 10 more minutes and like to cover two important questions. Uh, yes, the first one being, uh, um, like, once you have hired these people, for example, yes. uh, you know, you, you've got the, um, you know, the right guy, uh, the high profession, uh, like the highly performing person in mm -hmm. your team, or uh, you have built a high performing team. Now, how do you manage? What are your tips on managing this high performance team? Because it is full of people who are never short on opportunities. I think uh, all these yeah. people would, uh, uh, you know, would actually get better things whenever they want, like in terms of job or the salary right, or, right, you know, right, right, right. Yes. Yes. So how do yes. you really manage such a team once you are you have successfully found a way to build it? How do you manage it and manage the expectations and uh, make it really work for you? Yes. Wonderful question. So let me try to give a, a briefer answer on this one. Um, so I and we have found that um, the two best ways to retain highly capable uh, team members is one, make sure they have highly engaging work. Um, that means that you are making assignments that are appropriate for each individual's strengths and weaknesses and uh, desires. Now, of course, within reason, the business has a goal to achieve and they should know that. And they need to have the values that care about the mission above themselves to an extent, but everybody needs to also have personal growth. So giving them highly engaging work is, is very, very important. So on the consulting side of what we do, you know, we have a fairly large team. It's about 115 people right now and growing to about 200 over the next, you know, 18, 24 months or so, maybe 300 depending. Um, and so we only take, um, we only take engagements that, will be interesting to a team of highly performed people. Like there are other engagements that might pay more, but we don't take them um, because it won't be fun for us. And again, I, I recognize that that's a luxury not everyone has, but like fun can be defined different ways. Like as long as you are interested sufficiently in what you're gonna be getting up to do every day, that's part of the recipe for a high performing team and great outcomes. So work that is fun in whatever definition makes sense of that and engaging, which engaging means it has to be intellectually stimulating. It has to stretch people. It has to grow people. You have to have opportunities for that coaching in that project. If you're giving somebody a project that they've done 20 times before, they're going to, they're not, minds are going to be numb. So forget mind Bowser, it's going to be mind numbing. Right. Like it's going like, to. So if they're, you know, rotate people, don't have people work on the same thing over and over again just because they're experts. Give them new opportunities to stretch. Give them new opportunities to make mistakes is very important. You don't want people. Something we used to say at Bridgewater, we want people to, to we want people to dent the car, not crash the car. You can't let people crash the car because then your business is screwed. The client is screwed. Everybody's screwed. Right. Nobody wins. But denting the car is a very critical part of learning. So you have to have, as part of your environment, the ability to dent it sometimes without it crashing. Um, and, and the second one is culture. The second one is the environment. Like if you have a bunch of A players and you put them in a room with a bunch of B players, the A players are going to want to leave. Um, and the B player, the B players will feel inadequate, right? Like, so you can have B plus and A minus, right? But you have to set it up so that you have the right levels of people working together and that it's being held together by a leader that understands and can foster that dynamic, right? If you have A minus and B plus, the A minus can be the coach in some cases and the B plus can be the player. That works well and you develop people and you, then you bid bring up you give them b plus coaches you don't give them a plus coaches because they'll want to shoot themselves in the head every day 
Um, but you know, you have to create that culture and that culture has to include, maybe this sounds cheesy, but like it's an extended family. Like we care about each other. Like we're family. We are those brothers in arms. And if you have an environment where you have fun and engaging work, whatever that means for you, and you're in an environment where you love who you're taking that next challenge with, you know, usually a higher salary won't take people away from that environment. But if the environment is not good, you get an offer for some more money, you're out of there. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And then the next question that I'd like to know, uh, which uh, um, could be, um, you know, the end question for now. And again, we'll continue though. On, but uh, on this uh, primary topic, uh, yeah. next question that comes to mind is, uh, so uh, in order to manage all these people, like, uh, um, do you like, and especially when you, when it comes to scale, basically, what is the difference you see when it comes to scale of, let's say, from, you know, going from 20 to 50 people and then 50 to 100 and then 100 to 300, it's like you're mentioning as you plan for your different journeys, um, like how does the challenges and the solutions basically differ to be able to, um, I think, manage such a level? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's, and that's where we kind of get to the punchline of this whole thing, right? The maintaining quality, like, you know, scaling quickly is a huge challenge, no matter how good you are. Um, scaling quickly means that you're bringing in a lot of new people that don't yet understand the culture, that don't yet know the people. And you have to have a strategy for growing that keeps the ratio of people that get it to new people at an okay level. If you have too many people coming in at once and they overtake from a cultural perspective, the folks that are the anchors, it's gonna unwind. So when we're thinking about, um, and actually that's what Nuno does for our team, he is in charge of our growth strategy. Um, if you, are thoughtful, that's the best thing you can do. And what I mean by thoughtful is if you're at a 10 people today, well, it's very different, right? If you're at one person today and you want to get to 10, that's a very, that's a much easier challenge than going from 10 to 100. And going from 100 to 1,000 is really effing hard without messing everything up. So one to 10, right, you just want to get a bunch of like really great people that get along that share that common mission, that have aligned values. And you give them the right roles and responsibilities. This is a whole other topic, right? Role, how do you define roles and responsibilities and how does that machine work in terms of interactions? But let's just say that's a given for now, for simplicity. You give them the right roles and responsibilities that are aligned to their strengths and weaknesses, their passions, and so on, and the business needs. And, and, and you're a decent manager, you'll probably be okay. 10 to 100 is really much harder. 10 to 100 is harder because you now have to start to get into this very thoughtful space of, well, if I only have 10 people, I can't hire 90 in the next six months. Like that'll never work, right? So how do you do that? You just have to like pace it. So if you have 10 and you want to get to 15, 20, when you're at 20, then you think about getting to 30 and 40, you start to break it down to those smaller chunks and make it more manageable and more manageable in two dimensions. One is those roles and responsibilities again, which is a different conversation. But the second one that's more important even is that culture. Like if you bring in people that have aligned values, you still have a risk that they misunderstand for a while. It usually takes, um, you know, at least several months before somebody really understands the environment they're in, even if they think they get it. And it generally takes about 18 months for somebody to change a habit. And a habit can include how do you operate with your colleagues and your team members. So, you know, it's just a matter of pacing. And when I say just a matter of pacing, way easier said than done. So it's breaking it into chunks, taking those smaller milestones and making sure that you're not bringing people in too quickly and that you're not expecting unrealistic things. You can't expect someone new to not only be productive in two weeks, 
but also to be a perfectly, you know, contributing part of the culture, that's not realistic. And so you have to think about the timelines of how human behavior operates and how it changes and adapts and bring in people that are not going to outnumber the folks that you would consider culture carriers, right? The people that really hold it together. Um, and then going from 100 to 1,000 is that same problem, but much harder because now you can't do it as a single unit anymore. You now have to break it up into different units because you can't have two, 300 people in one group. It's just too many. It doesn't work, right? You have to have the right ratio of like a manager can only really manage like five to eight people effectively. So like you just, you know, you do the hierarchy and it just doesn't work. And so now you have to have, now the problem with scaling to larger numbers is you have to be able to replicate that environment from 10 to 100 with multiple pe groups of people. And so now you not only have to have one or two leaders that can do it and leverage others, you now have to have like five or 10. So do you have those people or are you fooling yourself because you just really want to grow faster? Like if you don't have the right leaders for each of those groups, then maybe some of them will work really well, but some of them will start to create their own separate cultures and they'll start to operate differently. And um, then you try to move people around and it's a mess. Right, right. I, um, I think uh, the way I would put it uh, and learn you, I think uh, it's more about setting the foundation on which the growth can catapult, basically, like rather than thinking that uh, you could just uh, leap from one level to another. I think uh, what I think what I get from here is that you have to set up a system with a core team and uh, kind of keep it growing, basically like uh, with each person yeah. or each of the member basically being yeah. able to yeah and don't don't go too fast right one of the big secrets in life that took me way too long to to learn is mm -hmm. to really really go fast you mm -hmm. first have to slow down mm -hmm. right because <laughs> if you just go right into it fast 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 you're going to have success to a certain point and then it's right. going to fall apart but if you start slowly mm -hmm. and you take the time to build that foundation, as you're saying, and you grow it and evolve it at a rate that is workable, mm -hmm. then once you get to a certain point, it's mm -hmm. going to be a self-sustaining organism. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to worry about it so much. Mm -hmm. And then everyone is enabled to go very quickly. Right, right, right. So I, um, I think uh, that would be a formal discussion, the fireside chat session. Uh, from here onward, basically. Yeah.